in recent months, the Atomic Energy Commission and the Department of Defense have conducted important tests of an experimental device based on the thermonuclear principle, leading to the development of a very large yield weapon. In addition, a proof test was made of a large yield fission weapon. These constituted Operation Ivy. The report of these accomplishments is about to be presented in film form. We will show you new techniques and new scientific developments. We will minimize the portrayal of normal military service support since you are familiar with this aspect of test operations. As commander of Joint Task Force 132, I invite you to observe Operation Ivy, carried out on our Pacific Proving Ground, Annie Weetok Atoll. before the first blast, mic shot, of Operation Ivy. Uh, 59 minutes now, to be exact. We've been here since daybreak. Left we talk last night during the early morning hours. Now, as you can imagine, feeling is running pretty high about now, and there's reason for it. If everything goes according to plan, we'll soon see the largest explosion ever set off on the face of the Earth. That is, the largest that we know of. Some 8,000 men will view the event from this point. Oh, by the way, the carrier over there is the Rendover. She's primarily set up as a base for fighter security and helicopter re-entry. And that's the Curtis over here, the weapons assembly ship. In the time between now and HR, I'd like to show you around, if I may, and introduce you to some of the people connected with this operation. And in general, piece together the events which have brought us to this point. To start off, I'd like to show you something over here. You realize there are many miles of ocean between us and any Weetok Atoll. To know what's going on back at the Atoll, these antennas are receiving televised signals and are giving our men here a second-by-second -second account of what's happening on Shot Island. The television receivers are in here, in the control room. 
But before going inside, uh, let's take a look at a chart. It may give you a better idea of our location. This is our position. Ten miles south of Enuitak Island, or about 30 miles south of Yugalad, the shot island. We must keep a very accurate position here because of the televised signal. It's a very narrow beam, and the ship must stay within that beam. Now, perhaps you're wondering why we're out here in ships. Well, the answer is very simple. It's too dangerous on land. We're expecting a yield of from 4,000 to 10,000 kilotons. That's equal to between 4 and 10 million tons of high explosives. Uh, considering all possible effects from a bang of this size, the best observation point is at sea, on a mobile platform at a known safe distance from zero point. Okay, let's go inside now. Well, this is it. This is the control room. I'd like to have you meet Mr. Stan Burris, the commander of the scientific task group. Oh, Stan, I wonder if you could tell us something about the operations that go on in this room. Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, the screens you see in front of you enable us to monitor the uh, timing of firing system and the cryogenic system. The lights indicate that the uh, timing signals are functioning properly. The dials, this collection of dials, uh, indicates that the uh, liquid deuterium is in the proper state for firing. If you will look close, you will see that it is now 55 minutes before each hour. As time clicks off, more and more lights come into operation. This is the one minute light, 30 seconds, 15, 5, 1, uh, through firing. Since this is a thermonuclear test, we are using, and we are using a type of hydrogen in a liquid state, it is necessary to keep a close check on the condition of this fuel. The hydrogen is not in the proper state or at the proper level. It would have such a marked effect on the results that there is no point in continuing the experiment, in which case we would postpone the shot. Is there any chance of that so far, Bob? No, there isn't, Stan. The cryogenic system has been operating perfectly for several days, and we're not particularly worried now. That's fine. I have here a layout you may be interested in. This diagram will give you a general idea of the whole setup. Data from the sequence timer is piped over to a display panel. Likewise, cryogenics data is piped over to, to this display panel. This kind of display panel is new to atomic test work because of the large number of remote control and metering problems encountered in this operation. For one thing, the master timing and metering apparatus is located next door to the shot cab rather than being placed some 20 miles away on Perry Island as is usually done. This close view is possible, of course, because the lens of a television camera, rather than human eyes, is watching events. So cryogenics data piped direct from Mike and information from the sequence timer is transmitted from the small building attached to the main cab and is relayed by way of a TV antenna atop a 375-foot tower to the Estes. So that's the flow. From timer on through to display panel, Cryogenics data to panel, picked up by a television camera and relayed on out to the Estes. A very ingenious arrangement. But what happens if you have to stop the firing mechanism, or can you stop it? We can stop it all right if we have to. We have a radio link direct to the firing panel in the shot cab. If we have to stop the shot, we simply push this button. Just a simple flip of the wrist, huh? That's right, but a lot of work goes down the drain. You understand we don't want to stop this thing unless it's absolutely essential. No, I can understand that. Say, I was out on deck when you fellas returned. Well, that is, when the firing party returned. <laughs> uh, what happened out there on Shot Island? If you'll excuse me, I suggest you talk to Colonel Lunger about that. I have a timing signal coming up. All right. So then, Dick, the firing party's big job is to see the last-minute details of arming and firing and to make sure that the Shot Island is secure. That's the broad brush of it, yes. I've been a member of firing parties before, but this was different somehow. A man standing as I stood on the outside of the building housing the mic device couldn't help but feel to sense the importance of this moment. 
Inside, a handful of men were making a final check. We're arming a device which could be the key to a new era in atomic weaponeering. I don't know just how the others felt, but I felt small when I thought of the experiment being readied inside. This one test could take us out of the realm of kilotons into the fantastic world of megatons. And then, at H minus six hours, the job was finished. The mic device was on its own and ready. We all move to take a final look at the gadget, which represents a year of intensive engineering. As we move toward the pier, one couldn't get away from the feeling of being alone, of knowing you were the last to leave an island which might be shocked beyond human reentry. We made the run from Shot Island down to the anchorage of the Estes off Perry in a fast crash boat. Soon after, the Estes made way through the deep entrance between Perry and Japtan Islands out to a point 10 miles southeast of Perry, the rendezvous area of the task force ships. We finished our job at the cab, came over the side, and here we are. Waiting on station just like everyone else. Well, we won't have to wait much longer, Dick. All right, thanks. Well, that's part of the story. A small part, actually, of this whole ball of wax. An operation like Ivy has many facets, some large, some small. Behind the present activities on this ship, behind what went on at the atoll itself, whatever preparations had to be made in the States, is the broader story of policy, philosophy, of planning. Now, this deeper story, the background, so to speak, has its roots entwined in the broad international picture, in the larger aspects of the atomic weapons development program, in complex scientific conclusions. Not long ago at Los Alamos, I was talking to Dr. Alvin C. Graves, head of the test division there. He's on board now in flag plot as the scientific deputy to the task force commander. He's one of the men who can tell us about the thinking behind this operation. And we're not really sure of what progress the Russians have made in this business of nuclear research. And so the only safe assumption to make is that they're interested in producing a fission bomb and to use it as some sort of trigger mechanism for a hydrogen bomb. It's obvious we don't want them to have a hydrogen bomb before we do. And so time is urgent. Time is the thing we have to beat. Dr. Graves, the historical side of this operation is particularly important. I wonder if you'd mind speaking right to our camera. Not at all. First, let's go over this business of the hydrogen bomb. Why use hydrogen? Hydrogen permits us to have an inexhaustible source of energy. It's plentiful. Uh, we don't have to worry about the critical mass limitation. Second, we can get hydrogen very cheaply. If we can use deuterium, uh, we can distill it from ordinary seawater. We're floating on it right now. That's very interesting, Doctor. But what is deuterium? I was coming to that. First, let's uh, consider ordinary hydrogen, such as is used commercially. An atom of this kind of hydrogen has the simplest nucleus known. It has one proton. But hydrogen exists in two other isotopic forms. Deuterium, which has a neutron in addition to the proton, and tritium, which has two neutrons and one proton. Ordinary hydrogen is not considered a good bomb fuel. And tritium, because of its expense and rarity, can only be used in limited quantities. Well, that's part of the background of Ivy leading up to the present. In one minute, it will be H minus 45 minutes. H minus 45 minutes. Well, Dick, for a bit. All right, fine, Doctor. 